What's going on? It's Jason Heath. We're talking today with Michael Geib, who has just released two new albums, very different styles. One, Dragon Eddie Waltz is historically informed. One is a jazz album. Really hope you enjoy this conversation. So you're a bit of a bow collector. You got the Dragon Eddie bow and you got yeah. the, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'm actually, in the process of trying out a bow that I'm gonna buy, um, uh, by it, it's by Harry Grabenstein, mm -hmm. and um, it and I'm trying it out from Quantum Bass Center. But I've been doing, oh, uh, so, so one of the performance organizations that I'm a part of is the the British Center for Historical Performance, which which is the as far as I'm aware the only historical performance organization in the state of Oklahoma, and. I, I had colleagues that were a part of it, and I would be, a, you know, I would play a little bit. But um, after going to the 2017 ISB, I actually bought a bow from Chris Brown while mm. I was there. And after that, I kind of realized that if I was going to do this, I should go all in on it. So it's been it's been a process. So I have so I have a couple um, classical Dragonetti style bows. I have another Baroque bow that's underhand and the irony in all of this is actually um in my training um I, i'm a french bow player <laughs> and, and all of my teachers are french bow players so yeah uh, mm -hmm. that's interesting well so i um <clears throat> I, I i you probably know george amarim uh yeah oh yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so george and i i was down in south texas doing a concert with him at the beginning of the month and i was you know he uh, has a a bow collection similar he has many bows <laughs> and some dragon yeah. Eddie bows and he was saying hey you should have you ever thought about checking out a a broke bow and i'm a french bow player you know by training too and and he had a a french broke bow by i believe it's philip smith i can't believe i'm blanking on his name but a tasmanian bow maker so i bought it i just kind of on a lark i thought okay why not so i've been playing around with it and it's been really you can almost see it on my wall not quite it's yeah. by my base over there <laughs> but but it's been fun to play it's my only foray outside of just my french bow playing and it's been interesting just um what a different experience it is playing on the bass and then i was checking out some of some of your youtube videos too and seeing you playing with the dragon eddie bow that's like even a that's like a totally different thing too with that yeah. thing right well and what i've well, first of all, I kind of got into this. Um, oh, my major professor, uh, Melanie Punter, who um, was the professor of double bass at Florida State um, until recently, until George Speed started there. But um, but she was my teacher, my mentor, and um, I owe everything to her. And uh, but but she, even though it wasn't something we worked on exclusively, but but she's always been an early music player and kind of got me just interested in it to start with and um but she plays with the atlanta baroque orchestra and some other organizations but that was kind of my first step into all of this and uh um but then when i started i i, I with one of the recordings you know that are the all of the dragonetti waltzes um when i decided it was something i wanted to do because i'd always loved that music and it had just been it, it had been a part of my life for such a long time. There was one of my first teachers, his name's Ian Burkita, hit me to those pieces, and but I realized I'm like you know if I'm going to record these, I want to try to I want to try to go all in, and and it's always difficult to find. I I knew I wanted to do it with that type of bow, mm -hmm. um, and but finding one is uh, is difficult. I, at the 2019 ISB. Because I mean, you know, at those conferences, how many bows are there? It's it, it's over, <laughs> it's overwhelming. But I, I only remember finding like maybe four or five bows in that style that you could to even try, right? Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I found that was interesting was that all the bows were really heavy, mm, right? Okay. And and uh, and so after, but but I'm glad I had that experience because then I knew what I was looking for and. Uh, the, the bow you see on a lot of the YouTube videos and the one that I, I did the recording with is made by David Herman, who's a maker yeah. of the Czech Republic. Oh, and, yeah. He does great bows. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he's the guy. He doesn't just do Dragon Eddie bows. I mean, if you want a copy of a Sperger bow, a Von Hall bow, um, overhand, underhand, I mean, he, he, you know, not to give him a free promo, but he does, he does everything and he'll ship bows to you. And what was really great, because... Uh, 
and, and this was pre-COVID when I bought the bow, but even then flying to the Czech Republic to, to try something out was probably not going to be very cost effective. So, <laughs> uh, and, um, but it, it was great because he had a bow that it, it was a Dragonetti style bow in the weight range that I, I wanted. And, but he even built basically another version of that before he sent it over to try them. Um, so I had a couple wow. basically of the same thing that I could try out, which was great. So, and, and I love it. And, um, it, 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 again, you know, with my training being a French bow player, when I started teaching, um, at the university level and especially teaching a lot of, uh, high school students through our private studio and also through the American string teachers association, um, <laughs> you know, this happened, uh, I got into underhand blow playing because I had this hotshot high schooler that wanted to study with me, but was a, was a German bow player. And I said, oh, geez, I can't let this, like, you know, this 13-year-old, like, show me up on German bow. I mean, this was 10 years ago, but <laughs> <laughs> so I, that, that's when I really started to take it, you know, to take it seriously with everything that I was doing. That's but I don't awesome. Know, yeah, and, I mean, maybe the, this is, I don't know how this relates, but, but in your teaching, because... In some ways, you, some people would argue, oh, you should start somebody in this type of bow or this, you know, overhand, underhand, French, German. But I found in my teaching that a lot of times students, it's it's about half and half. Their hands just tend to gravitate towards one or the other. I don't know if you've had that experience. I've, I've never told anybody to play French bow or German bow. They've showed up. A, f a couple of them have switched. Yeah. It is. I've never. I, I have also probably not this is not good but i've just i've never i actually have on my to-do list this week i probably won't do it because i've just run out of time to like finally order a german bow and start mucking around but i've had i've i have several students playing german bow in professional groups and i have i taught taught them you know it, it matters less than many think you know, and so oh, I've, I've, I, but but I do love you know when I'm I, I, when I do teacher clinics or whatever like the 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 thing I like to talk about is you know with bass you have a the option of a hard reset. You know, if you have someone who's a violinist and they move to bass and they've got like disaster zone bass, you know, you know, bow, <laughs> yeah, yeah. bow qualities, yeah. there is this other bow and you could sort of yeah. nuke and pave and start over again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's interesting. I've actually with this the uh, broke French bow I, I bought, I've been actually practicing it German nice. style as well because it's good. You know, it's, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, um, but but uh, I it, yeah, I need to experiment i i've been, i've been saying this for 20 years but i need to experiment more <laughs> yeah. well and necessity is the mother of invention that's why i got into it and but a part of me often wonders if because i learned french bow um because it's what my teachers did and and at the time i thought it was maybe preferred i don't know mm -hmm. but it was but i mean if you read a lot of what fred zimmerman talked about i mean he he talked about being just competent with both types of types of bows and they have advantages and disadvantages and but I, part of me even wonders and this is no disrespect to my teachers or anything but if because there's part of me that almost feels like the german bow in some ways feels a little bit more natural in my hand mm -hmm. um no not not neglecting because uh, i'm uh, i'm glad that i learned how to play french bow and especially in orchestral situations i find that it helps me match a lot of the other bowings that are happening um plus my wife is a cellist and you know we'll play some music together and it's a way that we can um we can really sync our sound so yeah if that makes sense yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know you mentioned about holding a, a, an overhand style bow underhand um i know uh you, you probably know nick scales at West oh Texas. sure yeah um, yeah yeah he uh he has a bow because I, I was out there a couple of years ago just doing a recital and, and working with his great students. And he has a it, it's it's an underhand bow with a really skinny frog is the best way I can describe it. And you can actually switch back and forth. Mm -hmm. And and I think Nick Walker has a bow like that. Too. Yeah. 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 I, I, I know that it might this might not be the bow maker, but Boris Fritsch, I believe, mm -hmm. is a maker that may. And uh, David Allen Moore is playing on some yeah. of this kind of like skinny. Mm hmm. Skinny frog German bows. They're French German kind of hybrids. That that's what I really need to pick up because that would be a, a lot sure. of fun to experiment with. Cool. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it it's um yeah, it's 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 just a whole a whole bunch of fun once you get once you start to go down that road. I got to be careful. I don't know about you, but like I can I can get obsessed with gear like like many musicians and then, <laughs> yeah. you know, like $4,000 later, you know, I'm, I'm like what have I done? So so I I always try to watch out with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I never thought of myself as, as a gear person, because for the longest time, I only had one double bass, um, which you can see, it's the, the one over on this side. Um, mm-hmm. her, her name is Dolores, and she's a mid-1800s Tyrolean instrument. And But, but uh, I mean, I love that, that bass, and um, I got her at uh, David Gage mm-hmm. you know, in, in New York City. And um, But she just kind of had to work for everything. And But then after I got married and... Uh, you know, started making a little more money and things like that. It, it, it can be. We, we don't need gear a lot of times to make the sound that we want. But sure, and, and that shouldn't be an an excuse. I don't think it's like, oh no, I need a different instrument to do this. But it's kind of like you were talking about with with trying out the the baroque bow. You know, I mean, it the differences in the sound and the tone quality and the colors and everything are just really fantastic. And um, I'm fortunate enough now to have uh, different instruments for different setups and things like that. Because on the uh, on the other album, on the jazz album, um, I had a bass that's not pictured here, but just with a what with, with what I would call a just my ideal jazz setup with a certain type of strings and string height and and pickup and it's not even that special of an instrument, but but with that combined with the uh, the amplifier that I use, it it makes it was to to make myself as as comfortable as possible in the situation and. The, and on a lot of the videos, you know, like I said, I got all in on a lot of this uh, um, historical playing, especially kind of in the style of Dragonetti. Um, it's been such a wonderful experience, especially playing on gut strings, which has been, that was probably the most difficult transition. Um, the album is not on gut strings, by the way. I wish I was that brave. I'm not. But the, but, and that was actually one of my quarantine projects. I said, okay, because my wife is a, is a Baroque cellist as well as a, 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 a more modern cellist, if you will. But that, that was one of the biggest differences in the sound quality, I think. Because um, mm. when, I, and I talked about this, you know, in the, in, in the ISB presentation this past summer, but I think when people want to get into historical playing, it, it's a little daunting because you're like, wait, I got to buy a bow, I got to get an instrument, I got to get a different bridge, I need a different tailpiece, I need strings. And it, 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 it I mean, that's a lot. I mean, and who can afford to do all of that, <laughs> you know, especially at once. And, uh, but I almost like to think of it sort of like a scale. Mm-hmm. I mean, and forgive me, but I like to call it a hip scale historically informed performance, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. So you have like a level kind of one to five of a hip scale. But I, I think one of the easiest ways a lot of times students or, or, or professionals or anybody, if you want to get into it, just trying a different bow or yeah. um, Thomas Wolfe says that one of the best ways to get to recreate the sound is, is with the gut strings. And mm-hmm. um, now, uh, before I get ahead of myself, I mean, um, gut strings can be expensive, but I've been using... Uh, these red diamond gut strings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're, I think, uh, I'd have to look it up online, but they're around like 280 for a set. Oh, which that's, is not... pretty, that's pretty reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Now, look, I mean, Perastro, you know, makes some of the, the best gut strings, and there's a lot of other makers out there that, you know, the, the kinds of folks that make like, you know, a few sets a year. I mean, there's the, the, like the type of strings that like Heather Miller Larden would use or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, it, it is possible, you know, to to get into it without having to spend just a, a truckload of money. And that's, yeah. I think that was one of the things that kept me away from it for a long time. Because I said, if I want to do this, I, I want to go all in. I want to, I want it to be as authentic as possible. But going all in is is pricey. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember meeting Gerd Gensler, uh, the, the, the string maker. And I, he is, uh, what is the name of his? He st- they started a formal company uh, recently for, for strings. And I'm just, I'm blanking on the name, but, but uh, there, and I've, I've talked to them. I want, I want to talk to 
Garrett or his son, son somebody involved because they're they're like top secret amazing strings. You know, they're like a eight hundred dollars a set, yeah. and he <laughs> it's like you have to have a, a conversation for a, a couple hours about what you do before they make the strings, and those are amazing. But like getting in on the something something like those strings you're describing for a, a few hundred bucks that's that's in, incredible. I I almost I I'm such a non gearhead. I like almost never talk about this stuff, but I I finally that base in the corner over there is finally leaving the condo for the first time since March 2020. I played my last oh. gig in March 20, and I've, I've played some gigs, but I, they've been out of town on borrowed bases, but I'm finally rolling it down to San Francisco Symphony and subbing in a couple weeks. So I, and I've been nice. playing on these Parastro Perpetuals, which are very good. Everything from Parastro is great. So I'm going to go super yeah. bass geeky here, but but, but it's, it's, sorry for folks listening. Appar- apparently we've started, but that's just how this podcast goes. Um, and um, uh, but they are not like I'm not going to blend in on those Parastro Perpetuals. You know, I can I can like pluck the open D, go get a cup of coffee, come back. It's still ringing. <laughs> so I took them off, but I thought, all right, if I'm going to actually like go to the trouble, and I have the Sloan tuners, so the 50 to one gear rate. Ratio. If I'm gonna like, if I'm gonna take the couple hours to like do this, let, let's like, let's play around with some strings. So I took I took them off and put uh, uh, Diderio Zyx on, which are also probably not strings I'm gonna take to the gig. But I thought, well, let's just play around. And I, I've been I got that broke bow. I've been meaning to like record some examples of that, and I put those on it. And it's hilarious. Two str- two strings that folks might use for jazz. Um, very different, but actually my like hour of playing on the Zyx, I kind of am digging those Zyx. So like that's this is like a super babbly way of asking like, what's your jazz setup? What do you like sure. for what do you like for jazz these days? You know, it, it's funny that you you say that. Um, so for the longest time, I, I used the string that everybody used, the Spyrocore. Sure. I mean, you know, which I mean, you can't go wrong with. You know, yeah. I, that's and uh, but. And, and then I tried some Bel Cantos and I tried some other ones, but it, I actually, specifically for a jazz setup, because I'm fortunate enough to have different instruments, I actually use the Zyx strings. I, nice. I like, yeah, and and I've been using, Lynn Seaton hit me to those strings because he was using them for a while. And th- when you put them on, they're, um, they're a little bright. As yeah. you can imagine, <laughs> they're, but I they're really get, bright right now. <laughs> yeah, and they but they almost get better with age, and okay. I feel like I read somewhere that the company was trying to get almost kind of a gut tone through through those strings. But uh, now, obviously, with those strings, I don't I don't do a lot of arco playing. But again, after they're on there for a while, they work really well. And it's funny on my uh, on. Uh, the bass that I, I use primarily for, you know, for orchestral playing, uh, recording, and things like that. Um, it, I've had Kaplan's on there for a while, this, and but I had Zyx on that bass for a while, and I I loved the brightness that they can bring to it. The one reason why I kind of don't recommend Zyx to students that are doing a lot of arco playing is that I don't find that they're the most arco friendly string. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, which <laughs> which I think you've No, look, when when you when you're doing it right, it, they really can sound fantastic, but they're not it's not like playing bel cantos or or like the original flexicores by Perastro. Like you're, you know, I mean they just they're going to sound great with the bow no matter what, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's what I use for a jazz setup. Um, and then for more of an orchestral setup, I mean, not to be a, you know, to hype to Dario too much, but, um, but I use the Kaplan's mainly for orchestral playing because I, and there's, there's so many great strings. Um, but w- one of the reasons that I've, I've been drawn to a lot of those Dario strings is that they're, they're good products and they're, they're affordable. I mean, a lot yeah. of times, you know, that's just, and that's the reality of it for all of us. Right. So, oh Yeah. Yeah, Diderio, Diderio, I love Diderio. They've they've been a sponsor. For, they're not a sponsor right now, but they've been a sponsor for years. So, but but still, shout out to Diderio. And it's funny yeah. putting those Zyx strings on my bass. Um, I I think I always forget when I'm talking to companies th- to mention that I have an extension. So I've gotten strings sent, and then I so so I I have the top three strings for Zyx, but I but I have the my low my extend extension. So I and I knew I had to get that 
perpetual off before the San, San Francisco. Because that was the, the 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 low string was the most temperamental. It was like yeah. it, it, you know, and and so so I I was digging around in my string box and I. I I found this like dusty old Kaplan extended E and I actually had a newer one but I just couldn't find it so I put on yeah. this one from like 2016 so it is hilarious to like bow right now my open strings because it's like G D and A <laughs> had this like bright sort of tangy quality and then I have just this the dead dead as you know winter kind of kind of low string but but like for strokey stuff and to blend in those Kaplan's are great but, but you know, for the Zyx, there's something really interesting about them to me. And I, back in 2017, I was getting ready to do a recital, and I was going to play them on Zyx, and then I don't know why I like chickened out. I think I was even more conservative about strings then, so I pulled them off. Um, but there, there's, there's a really interesting quality to them, and I, I don't know the the one, the thing that that freaks me out. Strings are so weird, but like I was practicing yesterday, and. I'm just not used to that type of core, and I found sure. that like I was having a hard time. I don't know why I was having a hard time playing in tune, but I was having a hard time like like they they just respond differently. Like even like maybe it's the 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 pressure from the I don't like pressure, but I'll just use the from the left hand or like something. I was like I'm like I know I'm on D on the A string, yeah. but like D is not exactly coming out. So we'll, we'll see. I've got a couple of weeks to play around with them, but they're they're interesting. And I I did a Diderio uh, factory tour a few years ago, and I got to actually see all these strings being made. And Zyx is super interesting because it looks like a bunch of doll's hair. When you hold it up, you know the core. It's just yeah. It's the it's the Zyx is the name of the synthetic material yeah. they, that they use for the core. Interesting strings for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and it it again. I'm I'm I feel really fortunate that I'm in a place to where to be able to have a more specialized setup. I mean, let's you know something my dad always said. Uh, you know, a dadism. You know, the right tool makes any job easier, right? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. and it's funny because I always tried to shy away from, I never wanted to be a gearhead. You know, I have friends that are guitarists, nothing, I'm not gonna say any guitarist jokes today, but <laughs> you, you know how it is with the gear, the different guitars and the pedals and the tuners and the, and, 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 it's, and it's a lot. I said, I'm never gonna be like that. And here I am, you know, I have, I have three separate double basses and I have, I have a bunch of different guitars. And, but again, it's, a lot of it has risen out of, I'm making excuses obviously, but I, a lot of it's risen out of necessity because I, uh, Professionally, I do a lot of theater orchestra work, and mm -hmm. um, I'm very fortunate to work with the Lyric Theater of Oklahoma, which is a fantastic organization. And I did a, a show a few years ago called Fun Home, which is based on a, uh, um, a, a graphic novel by Alison Bechtel. But the thing is, the book, check this out, the book called for five separate bases. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Really? I got wow. the... I, I got the <laughs> the contractor sent me, you know, the, the parts and everything. And I'm looking at this and I said, Hey, is this like, this is a, this is a joke. Right. And it's, but they wanted no joke. It was a, uh, um, it was, it was upright bass. Um, and then it was like a, a four string file uh, style fender jazz bass, you know, kind of like a la Jackson five, which I had, but then they wanted a five string fretless guitar, an acoustic bass guitar, and then a five string fretted bass guitar all in one show <laughs> and That's, that was, <laughs> you're, you're taking up a chunk of the pit right there with all that gear <laughs> <laughs> which i mean the cool thing was you know with the doubling i because i had to buy a couple guitars <laughs> for this show you're, you're like the highest paid person in that pit there. <laughs> yeah I, yeah it was yeah i mean it was i mean I, I bought stuff and i still ended up doing pretty well but it was um what, what was it was like a science experiment getting everything to work properly you know with and again i don't want to be like a gearhead but i tried to get it so that I could do all the switching that I needed to do, and then I just had to send one output to the soundboard because that would have been. It, I, I had like stress dreams about like, okay, I go to grab you know the fretless, and they like no, no sounds coming out on stage or something, you know. So it, it's super complicated <laughs> though when you get a signal <laughs> chain like that. Uh, um, <clears throat> my I, I, Tom Mendel is the bass player for. Ha uh, he's doing the touring production of Hamilton right now. Mm -hmm. He was playing Hamilton in Chicago for years, um, <clears throat> and I I got to watch Hamilton from the pit a few years cool. ago in Chicago and just the amount of gear he needs for Hamilton is <clears throat> pretty intense because he's got the 
upright bass. He's got the. Yeah. I think he has two electrics, and then he's playing keyboard bass as well, which is which is pretty wild. But yeah, yeah it's all that in <clears throat> getting the volume pedal set up right and getting all that, and then like even just when you're set up in the pit, like. Can I see the conductor? Can I grab this instrument without disturbing the other instrument? Here's the space I have to work with. I mean, that's stress dreams are 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 extremely understandable for something like that. <laughs> well, and and the other thing about it, sometimes you know, you might only have like eight measures to make one of these you know, to make a switch, right, right? <laughs> you know, and that's so that takes practice too. But but these are all I, I, I'm saying all this and I. You know, like you mentioned earlier with having the option to switch to do a hard reset with bows, I think one of the coolest things about being a bass player in the 21st century is is just the, all the opportunities we have to, to play different kinds of music with different people. And um, I mean, that's just something, I don't, it always just made sense to me, you know, to try to do that. And I know it can be kind of scary to try, you know, a style or a genre or something that we haven't done before, but that's... It, yeah, I, well, I mean, let me put it this way. You know, when I, um, bass wasn't my first instrument. I started on piano, like, like a lot of musicians. And then, and don't hold this against me, but I, I played trumpet, you know, for a little while. But, but I, one of the reasons I started playing bass was that I said, man, they, you know, the, hey, the, the music theater, you know, show, they, they need a bass player. And then the, you know, the youth orchestra is looking for bass players and the jazz band needs to be, everyone was always looking for a bass player. So I just saw it as an opportunity to, to try to play as much, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was younger. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those fascinating instruments that has so much crossover potential. I was, I was just talking yesterday with Peter Seymour, who plays in Project Trio, the long, I've known him for years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, it's funny, we were talking and we were like, oh, didn't I just have Peter on the podcast? Uh, no, the last time I had him on was like 600 episodes ago, but it's just sort of funny, like doing what I do. But, yeah. you know, just like, it's, it's interesting how... Okay, there's a question in here somewhere, Michael. So bear with me, but like, sure, sure, absolutely. Um, there's um, there's bass players tend to be self starters, and I don't know whether that's just my bias because I'm talking to so many bass players, or whether that's true. But it does seem like, like a lot of people, especially behind these classical crossover groups like Project Trio or Time for Three or mm -hmm. um, Sybarite Five, or we could go down the list. Bass, the bass player seems to be pretty integral to that, and I've I've speculated on why it seems like bass players are such self starters starters and doing other projects and it's interesting maybe it's the maybe it's the fact that we're people that are drawn to an instrument that plays a supportive role maybe it's that we're playing something where we're like doing something structural playing the roots maybe it's that we're sitting at the back of the group kind of watching everything maybe it's that our parts aren't quite as hard so we have more time to think about other things i don't know but that's like i've, I've thought a lot over the years about like why it seems like bass players uh branch off and experiment maybe maybe more and again this could be just my bias but maybe more than someone who's sitting in the first violin section of an orchestra well, you were at the the 2017 ISB. I yeah, imagine. I was. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I, I I don't know if you remember Gary Carr's just opening statements, his sure. keynote address, which was which which was moving and wonderful. Mm -hmm. But he he alluded to this, and he talked just a lot about all the options that we have. And I think because we have the option to do so many different types of things, it and and sometimes. And this is not to say that people shouldn't follow, like say if somebody wants to play in an orchestra and wants to follow that path, I mean, you you should do that. And that's something, and there's there's certain hurdles that have to be overcome for that process. But but sometimes, well, and, and, and maybe I can answer this just by, or not answer, but just talk about it with my own journey because th there was a long time in my life where when I was taking orchestral auditions and, you know, and I made some good sub spots and, uh, or got to, you know, got past the first rounds, et cetera. But I think I was doing it more because it's something I thought I was supposed to do rather than something maybe I wanted to do. Does, does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and, and, and look, this isn't to say that people shouldn't do that. I mean, if that's what, if, because that's, you know, that's the dream for a lot of people. So pursue that dream. But, but I found, I was always, uh, from a young age, I was always drawn uh, to, to playing jazz. First of all, my, my first, uh, uh, and at 
double bass teacher who really inspired me to be a musician is a gentleman named Delbert Felix, who is, uh, he was Brantford Marcellus' bass player for a number of years in the 80s and 90s and is on several albums. But I, I um, so here's a shout out to Delbert if he gets to listen to this, because I, I wouldn't have been a musician without him. I mean, he just, before that, before studying with him, I thought I was, I was going to be limited by my whatever abilities I had. And he was the first cat to actually show me how to practice Mm. like really practice and um and then and he showed me the the wonderful tradition of of uh, black american music known as jazz and he and he showed me and i think what drew me to that was the well for, uh one of the, one thing that was always tough for me i don't know about anyone else i was i was a terrible sight reader when i was younger i was i mean i couldn't sight read my way out of a wet paper bag man it was terrible <laughs> but it, it was but to be drawn to like this type of music where it's okay to not do that was actually quite liberating for me initially. And, and so now again, you know, fast forward a number of years later and I was doing a lot of these auditions and other things, but I still felt drawn to this music that inspired me to begin with. But, but it, but that doesn't mean, I guess that I didn't like playing with an orchestra or I didn't like playing other different types of things. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't know how much a lot of this has to be mutually exclusive and and it's nobody's there was a time in my life where I'd be like oh man the conservatory man they they're bringing us down and and I <laughs> and you know they're telling us we can't improvise and I um <laughs> I hope I really because I don't believe that I I don't anymore um I I used to be like that and uh it, because I don't think it's really any one thing. I mean, certain systems were put in place for a reason. I mean, we wouldn't have all of the wonderful bass literature and pedagogy we have without the conservatory method, without the Prague Double Bass School. But but those systems tend to lend themselves towards a certain, a certain type of playing. And I just thought to myself, I'm like, well, you know, I mean, maybe I just wanted to have my cake and eat it too. I don't know. That was, sure. yeah. And, and so that's always just to find joy and just playing lots of different types of music. And, uh, and one of the things that always made sense to me, and actually I, uh, I mean, you, you probably didn't have time to check this out as it's a, it's, it's a long document, but I, um, I wrote my doctoral treatise on teaching improvisation to orchestral double oh, bass players. I, 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 I saw that on your website. I, I haven't dug into it, but that's like one of those yeah. like uh, perennial like American String Teacher Association uh, uh, conference topics is like, exactly. I, I, I'm terrified of improv. How do I even begin? <laughs> well, I do. Uh, yeah. And, and I was, uh, when, and when I was initially writing it, I was, I wanted to make it more general, but my, my committee said, well, wait, has anyone talked about this just for bass players? And not just for bass players, how to address it for the orchestral bass player. And I said, I don't think so. And they said, hey, sounds like we got ourselves a topic. And uh, mm -hmm. but, but I think the, the, the problem, improvisation, a lot of times people think that it's something that they can or can't do, but it's, it's a skill. It's just like playing your Storch etudes, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that we just have to develop the skill for. But you need a process for doing that, right? And what I... But when I first started writing it, again, I, I kind of had that, you know, that real negative, like, oh, why aren't people teaching this type of vibe? And then, but, but again, my committee really helped me out. And they said, hey, you shouldn't, you shouldn't address it that way. And so I started to look at it more like an opportunity. And one, one huge advantage that a lot of orchestral bass players have to improvisation is that they have, they have absolutely flawless technique on the instrument. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not a hurdle anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate because to fine gentlemen and fantastic bass players um, gave me some wonderful um, interviews and quotes for the paper. One of them is, of course, Joseph Conyers. Nice. You know, yeah, he's okay. You know, last time I... <laughs> <laughs> and actually, at the time, he was in the Atlanta Symphony when mm -hmm. I interviewed him for this. Um, and then... Um, and then also uh, Kevin Malden, who plays uh, principal in Naples. And, uh, and because what I wanted... I, I was hoping to get just some information from from orchestral bass players that could show some evidence that learning how to improvise helped them be an or a better orchestral bass player, if you yeah. will. Yeah. And so that was the goal. Cause look at this as an opportunity not to, not to do something different, but to add to, to things that you're already doing really well. 
Mm-hmm. At least, and that, that's what I was going for. I mean, you can read it for yourself, see if I got there. <laughs> I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, it, was, it was interesting. This summer, I, I checked out Wabase this summer, uh, mm-hmm. and, and it was fun to watch like Hal Robinson leading these improv sessions. So you think nice. like, like, wow, all these people who are most certainly on mm-hmm. the orchestral finalist path, you know, like, like, like getting up and trading, trading fours, you know, it's Great. really interesting. Hey, wh- I'm curious, wh- where did you grow up? I hear a lot of Florida in your background, but where? Where are you from originally? <laughs> so I, I grew up in southeastern New York, actually. Oh, you probably wow. hear that. Yeah, okay. I was I was born in Mount Kisco um, okay. in Westchester County, and then okay. I, I grew up in Putnam County, just north of that. My dad worked in New York City like a lot of other people, but I probably have a weird mishmash of, uh, of accents because I lived there, and then after that, my family moved to South Carolina, which okay. um, is a little different. Thing. Yeah, that's a ma- that's a that, that seems like a major change. Well, no, I don't yeah. hear any accent, and I don't hear yeah. any accent myself. But people, I have a combination of a Minnesota, I have a South Dakota accent, which is like mm. take Minnesota and make it more hick somehow. <laughs> that's like what what people say. So I don't know what that means, but yeah. um, okay, wow. So when did yeah. you at what? How old were you when you all moved to South Carolina? I was in middle school, so I was twelve okay. or thirteen, okay. and we and we lived there, and I lived there for about ten years, and did a lot of my schooling there, and uh, I went to college there. I went to um, Clemson University, which is not typically known necessarily for its music program, but I had a I had a fantastic double bass teacher there named Ian Perkita. Nice. And uh, and and at the time, I was also studying with Delbert Felix outside of of school. And, okay. Uh, and then it was after that that I moved to to Florida to pursue graduate school at FSU, and um, and. I was really fortunate there because one of the reasons I chose to go to Florida State was that I, I, I had the opportunity to study with two specialists. They had multiple full-time double bass teachers there, which was mm-hmm. fantastic. Because there's only a handful of programs around the country where you're going to find that at a lot. You know, a place like North Texas, for example, is in a, it, it, or Indiana, you know, but the but – to be able to have two full-time experts and I took lessons and I already mentioned Melanie, Melanie Punter, who's my major professor, but I also studied jazz bass with the great Rodney Jordan. Yeah. Who, who, um, who plays with Marcus Roberts trio. But what was cool was that how much you hear a lot of the same information and don't, don't let Rodney fool you. Rodney is a, um, is a fantastic Arco player. Don't, you know, his first gig was teaching middle school strings in Jackson, Mississippi. So, I mean, you know, don't let him fool you. <laughs> he can do all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah, he's mm-hmm. great. I, just, I, 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 I think I just had him on the podcast recently with nice. uh, Christian Fabian. Oh, with their album that came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I did have him on the podcast. I, it's too early in the morning for me to <laughs> remember <laughs> what I what I've what what has happened in the past. But um, yeah, really, really nice guy and interesting person. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, it's interesting with the full time bass teacher thing and having multiple it's very rare you're right mm-hmm. and and even even it it, it <clears throat> it's something i thought about i was talking actually with george amarima about this uh last month like like the experience of studying with somebody that's there full time and in it full time versus you know i went to a school where you know i, I said with a wonderful player in the chicago symphony but he was you know adjunct and and then Constantly, they Northwestern <clears throat> tried to fire him like seven times because they're a bunch of morons, and and then and then ended up, you know, ended up, <clears throat> did end up, but but uh, you know, just the experience, like with with what what you, it sounds like you had in Florida at least, or um, North Texas or other places like that. It's 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 interesting to just just what that experience is like. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, and I'm I'm extremely grateful for that. And I ended up the the, the schools that I ended up that that were my final two were um, were FSU and and then UT Austin because mm-hmm. then at the time it, it was another place and that that was before Dajun taught at UT Austin, um, but uh, but again the, they it's because there were programs that were had two full time teachers to yeah. work with and. And that, that was a tough choice because I was like, man, I could live in Austin. There's a bunch of gigs there, and it was mm-hmm. going to be a great time. But, I mean, one of the big reasons I chose FSU was um, was because of the teachers. And just the, the, when I got to sit down with Melanie after my audition, um, and then and then looking at, you know, her credential. I mean, she's actually in New York right now playing at – she's retired from FSU, but she's playing with the Orchestra of St. Luke's at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Big deal. So <laughs> the – yeah, and uh, and and just seeing, you know, reading about what she'd done, and and they said, "No, I, I have this opportunity to study with two 
experts that are basically that are here. I don't mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about getting in touch with them for anything. And uh, and 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 it was a really wonderful experience. I mean, not and and I and and even though Melanie's retired, I can't say. I mean, because you know George Speed has been teaching there. It's it's funny because George used to live in Oklahoma. And mm-hmm. uh, what's funny is that we actually talk more now that he doesn't live here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, but, uh, but he, or, uh, but, but I can't say enough about, I, I think a lot of people forget about Florida State's music program because you think it's around the same size as an in Indiana or, or a North Texas and, and, and nothing against those other absolutely fantastic programs. I mean, you know, but one of the things that I always love and still love about being an FSU alumni is that I feel like we all, uh, whether it's alumni from the studio or it's just alumni from the program, we all stay in touch and we're all each other's cheerleaders. We really are rooting for each other and helping each other succeed in a lot of different ways. And I think, and I'm not saying that doesn't happen other places, but I, but I say, I definitely say it happens, you know, from the uh, FSU music alumni. So I'm, I'm, I feel really proud and really fortunate to be a part of that. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool when it does happen. And I, I don't think that's really happened for me. I don't, I don't really keep in touch with my cohort from Northwestern that, that that's getting ever further in the past for me but but it's really interesting when people i know talking to folks that went to rice they they have a certain like you know camaraderie sure. uh, as well so that's that's really cool so you're close to oklahoma city right mm-hmm. are you in like suburban oklahoma city is that how you describe yeah. where edmund yeah. is okay. yeah yeah i live in edmund i mean i could be I could be downtown at the Thunder game in like 20 minutes. Okay. If that okay. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so it's, and Oklahoma city is, um, it's funny. It, it for, I love Oklahoma city and my wife's from here, but, um, it, it, it has such a, a, an interesting history mm-hmm. and it has a lot of quirks that I don't think you're going to find a lot of other places. There's a great book called Boomtown, which is written by a sports writer actually about, it was written about the, the, the basketball team, but he ended up right. He, he was here a lot and he wrote a lot about just the different parts of the history and it's fascinating. And, um, but, but like, for example, Oklahoma city, you know, the land area is something over like 600 miles square miles. It is, it is spread out in a lot of different ways. So you have it and it's so cr- funny because you'll be in Oklahoma city and then you'll drive through what is it, like another town, like Nichols Hills or the village. But then, you drive and then you're back in Oklahoma City, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it's just fascinating. But um, Edmond is um, you know, it's 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 uh, just north of there, and it's it uh, it won some award in 2011 as like one of the America's best suburbs or something mm-hmm. like that. But um, but and it's but it's the home of um, the University of Central Oklahoma where I work. And so when I first moved here, because I actually got the uh, so I was, I don't know if I should be saying this, but I, I was actually 25 when I got the job and, um, it was, it, cause it was a full-time job and I was like, Whoa, no way. And, and, uh, but it was kind of last minute. It was, I was interviewing in like late July, early August for the start of that, like that fall semester. And when I found out I had a week to like completely just pick up my life and move a thousand miles away to a place where I didn't like know anybody. And, uh, so, you know, I, I ended up living, um, near campus and things like that but over time fast forward to where we are now i really love living in edmond because it has a a number of fantastic high school orchestra programs all three high schools in edmond have like three or four different string orchestras which is fantastic and uh my wife's a cellist and um she we run the studio together now but she started a private studio uh when when she was done with school and and so we're, we feel great about being close to a lot of our students and things like that in Edmond. And, uh, and it's, Edmond is a nice place to live. I mean, on top of just, you know, being close to whatever amenities. I mean, there's some wonderful parks. The city actually just voted to, to purchase some more land that's going to extend one of our, one of our parks. Uh, there's also free public transportation. I mean, oh, wow. uh, I know, right? Yeah. Uh, which you're like, what? No, cl-. I mean, and uh, as an East coaster myself, you know, and there's, it, it, it's a really, not that o- Oklahoma city is great too. It's just, it's bigger and more spread out and there's the covers more people, but Edmonds a super nice place to live. And, um, I feel really fortunate to live here and, and work here and be a part of the community. 
Yeah, yeah. Oklahoma is one of those places from from what I've learned, like the like really strong music, music in the schools, like Texas, you know, and and people like where I live now, California, uh, can, can, people can get super confused when you describe what music programs are like, like where you live or in Texas. It's they're they're not like that here. No disrespect to California, yeah. but maybe a little shade on California, like like they're that they, you know, like I moved from Chicago to the Bay Area, Sh- Chicago, suburb, particularly suburban Chicago has wonderful music programs you know multiple orchestras in each school you know that that sort of thing and you move here and it's it's not like that you know it they're they're just there's maybe one teacher doing band and orchestra in like fairly prosperous towns too and so yeah yeah it's super interesting so there's there's something really cool about um your your the part of the country you're living in now for for music education particularly well and and Oklahoma, what's funny, you mentioned Texas. We are Texas adjacent, after yes. all. And, uh, and, uh, and I won't even go into all the sports stuff because that's a different – I mean, that's, that's a totally different thing, which is really fun to be a part of and, and to witness. But, but being – because Texas is sort of where – I mean, I have so many. For, well, I mean, that's where I, that's where when we got to hang out at TNBA, yeah. I was down there yep. with one of my FS, FSU base brothers hanging out. That's where we mm-hmm. got to hang with Gabe Katz. But like yep. the, but you know, that's why he moved there from Atlanta. He said, "Wow, mm-hmm. it's like there's there's lots of jobs, there's lots of different programs, and music education is really important." And we know, mm-hmm. no, obviously, there's a lot less people in Oklahoma than Texas. But between the band and orchestra programs, the the ones that are here, I've I've noticed are all really really strong and music education is a really really core part of the community and, and for a lot of smaller towns it might be band oriented but they still have it i mean mm-hmm. there's you know they and a lot of the um the and a lot, sometimes you can tie a lot of that to high school football depending on what it is you know having a marching band but but that was something and again not you know i i have an east coast bias uh, which i'm still working on <laughs> and, <laughs> but when i moved here you know even from where i went to high school in south carolina or even where I went to, you know, some public schools in New York, just seeing, I expected there to be, oh, they're not going to have, they might have one orchestra in all of Edmond. I said, oh, wow, there's just, there's a lot going on here. And that's something else that's really cool about Oklahoma City and the reason why I love living here. Because some people might, and I'm, I'm not even talking about the scene in Tulsa, which has, also has a lot of wonderful things happening. I mean, you know, they have a fantastic opera company, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, in Oklahoma City, there's obviously there's the the flagship orchestra, the Oklahoma City Philharmonic, but Mm -hmm. you have a a fantastic theater company. And um, I mentioned Lyric Theater, which they partner with uh, like the Schubert Foundation in New York to put on new works and things like that, do a fantastic job. But then in Oklahoma City, you have other multiple orchestras there's like a string orchestra called the oklahoma virtuosi which does pop-up orchestras all over the place um we have the historical performance center which i mentioned the british center for historical performance uh there's um there's a wonderful opera company in oklahoma city called painted sky opera which uh, and their their hall is actually being renovated <laughs> right mm. now so they're but they're, but they're doing lots of creative things like they're doing a, a an, an opera um, next next June in an art space called um, Factory Obscura but, but it's a, it's Pagliacci so they're doing you know and so they're they're using all of these different cool artistic spaces to create these wonderful artistic experiences and, and I mean that's just a short list um, there, there's a wonderful jazz history here because everybody talks about Count Basie and uh, um, you know Kansas City but all that started right here the Oklahoma oh, wow. City Blue Devils oh yeah oh, there's wow. I didn't realize that wonderful okay. book called One O'Clock Jump the history of the Oklahoma City Blue Devils and I recommend it for any really for any musician that's interested it's 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 definitely worth checking out and there's between that and you think about somebody like Charlie Christian who basically is the father of the electric guitar and the, and jazz guitar i mean he's from right here and there's 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 a lot of just and Jimmy Rushing i mean there's the, there's such a wonderful wonderful history here and and to this day um there's there's a lot of musicians carrying the torch Mm-hmm. for that which is fantastic and there's i mean right now there's that there's actually three jazz ja- jam sessions happening in, in town which wow I love. yeah which, i think it's more than san francisco <laughs> <laughs> which is I'm one sure is weekly is. which is great but one of them that's monthly happens at this uh, a great venue called the ice event center but there that's where a lot of tradition is still held from a lot of these these wonderful artists that are from here or came through here and 
and, and the main thing, I mean, I try to be as much of it, you know, be a part of all of it as much as I can. But, um, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. You know, I like I like sleeping sometimes, too. Right. And but but where, where it comes down to, I, I see it as wonderful opportunities for my students. I tell them, like, man, you want especially now that people can get out and do a lot of things again. I said uh, more safely. And I said, hey, you know, don't. I mean, take your precautions, but don't miss these jam sessions. This is a great place to, to learn how to play. Don't. There's a lot of different concerts, and in fact, one of the things that I teach um, at, at my job is I'm this semester I'm covering our recital attendance class. You remember having to do that? In oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, now you know I every week I list all of the events that they that I know about that they can go to for you know different types of credit and sometimes i'm listing it i'm just like wow like really this is all these things are happening i mean not to you know n- not to feel like i'm making up for th- you know or trying to or how do i say um say like hey oklahoma is not so not so bad or things like that but it's it you would just be surprised what you find uh, like if you'd asked me 20 years ago it's like do you think you'd ever live in oklahoma i mean i i don't think i would have said no but i i i probably would have said something like, well, it's not likely. Right. But, but it, it, and just in my experience, you know, you want to, there's, there's a lot of wonderful opportunities in a lot of different places. And sometimes they're not places that people would all often think about, you know, and I mean, cause you know, as a, as a musician, <laughs> so here's something that's kind of funny and I'm going to put this out there. It's going to be on the podcast forever. But um, when I was a kid, my dream gig, okay, was to play in the Max Weinberg Seven, seven for the Conan O'Brien for the Late Show <laughs> for back nice. in the, you know, <laughs> and that was my again, you know, my mom's from New Jersey, so I mean, there's there's a there's a part of my soul that will always love Bruce Springsteen, right? Yeah, but sure. That was like, but then you know, to do a job like that, you know, you gotta you gotta move to New York, you have to make the right connections, and hopefully the opportunity presents itself. And I'm not saying that I I wish I could have done something like that, but. I, but I think a lot of us, and this is not to deter anybody from going to a place like New York or San Francisco and, and to be a part of all the wonderful music that's happening there. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that you'd be surprised a lot of places that these days, especially that you'll have so many wonderful artistic opportunities that you might and in a place where you might not think that would exist. And and I wouldn't have thought that about this place. And I'm just I feel fortunate that the this job brought me here and to be a part of it now. Yeah, I, I heartily second all of that. And I, I've i lived in big cities for a long time, but I'm, I'm from like four rectangles north of where you live, I think, or something <laughs> like that. I'm from South Dakota. And and it's it, it I actually, my first in-person podcast, you know, after the pandemic hit, was with a, a bassist in my hometown, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, who is like, he's like the the kind of does he does he actually does what uh probably a ton of people do that maybe you know that don't live in new york or la or something like that and and he's he you know he runs a non-profit you know performing arts organization he teaches some he he performs in a couple different groups uh orchestral and jazz and it's it's interesting and like you know sioux falls south dakota is way smaller than your and i i can't say anything negative about sioux falls ever on the podcast because my mom listens to all of these and she'll <laughs> she'll let me know um but uh, there's not much to say negative except the weather is absolutely terrible i will say that like Fair like enough. not that that keeps the riffraff out but it's absolutely miserable um but you know it, it's it's amazing what what opportunities the more i explore it's amazing what opportunities there are um yeah and the internet has only only broadened that in so many ways and and then you know coming from somebody who's lived like 30 years now i guess in like these big cities there's a lot of negative in these big cities too you know like my shockingly expensive condo here and you know the crime and the the congestion and all that sort of stuff so there there is it's it's always a trade-off isn't it sure well and a lot of people again it that should I, i have a lot of wonderful um, colleagues that are are now living in a, you know in a place like New York. Um, I'll give a shout out to uh, one of my one of my FSU bass brothers, Barry Stevenson, who's living in New York City now. Um, you should check him out. He's come out with a, a few different albums, and he toured with uh, an artist that people didn't know. He lived in New Orleans before this, and he toured with an artist named John Baptiste. 
that maybe people hadn't heard of before he was on the mm-hmm. on the Colbert show, right? Mm-hmm. But he's living there now, and it, it looks like he's doing a lot of wonderful, wonderful things. So, and for so there's lots of opportunities there, but there's also a lot of different places where it depends on what you're looking to do and how creative you are or how you know do you just want to try to play or do you want to be do you want to be playing and teaching do you want to run a performing arts organization and i think mm-hmm. to do a lot of those other types of things your your medium to smaller size cities are going to be places that have a lot of opportunities that a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't think about and i'm just thankful that um you know the universe brought me to a place like that where i just i and I love here that the, um, <laughs> you know, my wife's from Oklahoma City, so she can, she, I'm repeating her, so if you would, want to quote me, but she, she always says Oklahoma City is like the biggest small town on earth. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't see that as a bad thing, because in the musical community, we all really know each other. Everybody pretty much, which I don't think is a bad thing at all. I mean, people, and, and it's across genres, too. I mean, people know a lot of you know whether people are, are playing in the orchestra or they're playing for uh or if they're playing jazz and commercial they're working in the theaters um and you'd be surprised what opportunities have come up actually one thing that's really wonderful here is that uh, one of our convention centers downtown just got turned into a giant soundstage for films wow and yeah well and um the, the um uh, Patrick and Christina, who who started the you know the label that the albums are coming out on, which shout out to them because they're um, I can't thank them enough for for everything they've done just for the musical community and also just to uh, uh, and for me <laughs> believing in me as an artist because sometimes you know we get we get so down on our own playing you're just like no this sounds terrible and but so I can't I I'm, I have nothing but just profound appreciation for everything they've done but they work a lot. Um, with working with companies, you know, to for doing a lot of film scoring and things like mm. that, which is which, again, who would have thought, right? You know, you have to move to LA, but a lot of different production companies have been coming here, and I'm gonna have a geek out moment here a little bit because I um, I love '90s action movies. Nice, and I'm a huge fan <laughs> of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm putting it out there. Um, if he ever wants to, you know, give give me, you know, give me a call or whatever. But, but um, so I love action movies okay yeah. and so and and this was this was during you know the pandemic last year but we were able to safely record everyone you know distance masks yeah, etc yeah. but we were um we were recording for a film called what josiah saw and it was filmed all here in oklahoma and i looked over my shoulder at the screen to see and um there was an actor named robert patrick which i don't know if you know from uh, the uh, Terminator Two Judgment Day. He's he's the bad guy. He's, oh, he's the T one thousand. He's the T one. Okay, okay, sure, of course. <laughs> and so yeah. when I saw that, I was like, "Whoa, oh man, this is." And so I and I, I had personally had just a little a little fan moment, if you will, um, while while I was just working. But <laughs> but again, you wouldn't. And I I'm, would I have ever thought that would have been a part of my life here? No, but I'm just I'm really I'm really grateful and 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 really and so just thankful you know to be playing an instrument where a lot of these different types of things are are certainly possible yeah you know? what, what was cool about that session too i had to uh, like so many bass players i have a c extension but i i actually had to play a b flat zero i had to tune my c extension down by a whole step wow <laughs> that's, even... that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> which was that was that was kind of fun i mean you know it's the little things that you remember like that so that's a that's a fun note I, i've got a, 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 a friend in chicago named doug johnson who has a five string so and he would tune that b flat b down to b flat or on occasion oh, down to an a <laughs> Wah, 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 wah. Awesome. You can actually like see the oscillations of that string, but it's like truly incredible. And Doug has some, he had some theory. I, I, I need to like talk to Doug about, about that more. But there's something about that note B. There's something a cosmic about the note B. Like the, the unit, I, I don't remember what it is at all, but like the earth, like, like there's a radiation at that pitch of B, but there's something, there's something like, cosmic about the that low b that i can't i can't yeah. remember besides the fact that it just feels awesome so he's a yeah yeah 
that's that's really fun. So okay, so uh, eighty uh, '90s action. So what are your what are your top '90s action movies? So we throw Terminator. Is was Terminator Two in the '90s? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, was I that... believe. I mean, Google me, but I think it was 1990 or 1991. Yeah, that was like the, so, yeah, the, one I, of the I believe... very early uh, CGI, yeah. right? Because it was like yes. the Abyss, Michael Cameron, yep. the Abyss, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. kind of underrated or not yep. watched, and then Terminator Two, which was yeah. you know big. But okay, what else? What else? I, do you like? Well, I also like the. I mean, I, when I say '90s, I'm I'm always a big fan of the uh, the action movies. But I, uh, you know, True Lies by James Cameron oh, with Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger and True Jamie Lee Curtis, yep, and yep. Um, <laughs> and also um, the, it, it's a little maybe it's kind of a violent movie by today's standards. But also um, Total Recall, the original one, you oh, know, where they yeah. go to Mars. Yeah. And, oh, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, those are just some of my, I, don't, I mean, when I'm having a bad day or something and I just need to, and I, I just want to wax nostalgic, I'll just, I'll put one of those on, you know. <laughs> was was under was under Siege in the 90s? I'm trying yes, to remember that. I was like Steven so, Seagal. Yes. I love those Steven yes. Seagal. It's, it's hilarious yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. To, because I mean, I I, gra I graduated high school in '94, mm -hmm. um, which still doesn't seem that long ago to me. Although I, it, it it is a, a chunk of time ago at this point. But like, boy, it's it's hilarious how dated some things from the '90s can feel. By the same token, I'm also a big fan of like '70s. You know, the '70s. You know, like the big cinema boom and the French yeah. Connection and stuff. It's also interesting to me to go back to movies from like the '70s and see how. How little has changed in some ways too. Like sure. that's that. Like once you hit the seventies, I, I, I don't. I don't think my wife completely agrees with this. But but my <laughs> thing is like almost everything is basically the same except the technology. Like sure. we have phones and all that. But like you know people are kind of dressing the same. Things look crappy, kind of like they still do. You know like I love like <laughs> Dirty Harry, yeah. especially yeah. like moving to San Francisco, <laughs> like watching those San Francisco, like the like um the the conversation uh, or all that sort of stuff. So it's mm -hmm. it's. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Just yeah. curious. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, hey, I, I so uh, did record. So you recorded these two. So is it, it's it's Onyx Lane Records, right? So is mm -hmm. that, are they, these are the folks you're talking about. That yes, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, cool. Christina uh, Christina Giacona and Patrick Conlon are the folks that that run this the fine organization. And okay, and and you had not done these are your first solo record. Or correct. Like, okay, okay. So what was it like listening to yourself with that oh, level of scrutiny? Because like even me, I, I like I, I just had this course come out, and I, I'm just so disappointed in myself <laughs> every time. Or the, I, the, 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 the Discover Double Bass course. Yeah, and so about? I, I yeah, listen yeah. back and I was like, wow, Jason is like, all right. That was quite out of tune. That was a bit awkward. That was, and even I was playing something. I have a student who's working on a piece in this, and I played the recording. I was like, "Here, I'm probably in better shape on this recording than I'm right now." And then I like made some mistake, and even he laughed. And so it's like, like, so what was it like? Um, yeah, listen to yourself with oh, that man. level of detail. <laughs> so the, so the process for for the album for the for um, the jazz album, which is all original music, that was. The most important thing to that was just hiring people that I I I knew would do a, come in and do a fantastic job for the recording and uh, and the way we did that album we actually did probably three to five takes of each tune and I just picked I I picked which one I like we didn't do any any editing further than that because with the style of music I wanted that to be to kind of recapture some of the moments if you will mm -hmm. um, so that was the toughest thing about that was just listening to all of the different cuts and say, well, which one of these do I want to represent the music? And no, th there was occasionally the one, and there's a ballad on, on the album, which is actually the first tune I ever wrote. And, and it was easy because I, I take, um, an improvised arco solo on it and two out of three of the arco solos i'm gonna say were just like garbage <laughs> so it made it to me <laughs> and one i thought was okay and that's the one that's on the recording <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so and so that would but it was i mean we recorded that the album in <laughs> actually we're going back to may 2019 is when we recorded and i spent probably the next four or five months just listening to the different takes and then it wasn't just picking the takes it was just then doing you know the mixing and the mastering and listening to the different mixes so that that was a process mm -hmm. that was a little easier for me because it wasn't just me um for this oh, for the for the for the dragonetti album now 
I, I felt really well prepared because I've been playing the music for a long time, but that was, um, as you can imagine, <laughs> was, was, was difficult. And oh. now with, with this, I mean, I can honestly say that, you know, not, not all of, not all of them are straight takes, you know, there's some, there's portions of the takes that we've put together, you know, using some of this, but it, it and it required just a lot of humility mm -hmm. and, and being able to just accept honest critique from from those around me and and again i have to thank christina and patrick because if something wasn't right when even when we were recording they would tell me they're like mm -hmm. they're like mike man g major scale <laughs> i'm like i know i'm sorry <laughs> and, and so we would and so they they were really so so just being able to accept the criticism knowing because they wanted everything to be as you know at the best that it could be. I mean, that was almost harder than listening to it in some ways, just being in there in the moment. Because we recorded about, and this was early on in the pandemic. It was, um, it was in March and April of, of 2020 was when, which was again, I this I'd always wanted to record these pieces, but I said this is the perfect opportunity for a yeah. solo album, right? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know? And but I so it it was about four or five days. Of just of, of focusing on different movements, um, and uh, and and then just you know having and because Patrick and Christina are also really fantastic you know musicians um, in every way and one of the reasons why I love working with Patrick, we we met actually working in the theater because yeah I mean he's he's a wonderful classical violinist as well but he's a composer and he's a violinist that improvises too and that's kind of how we we had. You know, we first met and got to perform together, and really enjoyed working working together. So I hope he still enjoys working with me after after all this. <laughs> <laughs> but the but we but uh, it was great knowing throughout the process that I could trust them that they not not only are they listening to everything that's happening, but they're able to look at the score, l listen what's there, and say, "Hey, this is what we have here." And that like they you know you play pieces for long enough, a lot of times. And I'm always, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. I always memorize things or try to memorize things quickly. And then the problem with that is that sometimes you memorize something wrong. Yep. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yep. And so I would, you know, the, the, during the recording session, they had to point out like, hey, this is a triplet. This isn't an eighth, you know, these aren't eighth notes. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> so that was something. So I can't thank them enough for just, for being there just to point those things out and, and to critique as I was doing it. And then after the fact, you know, we when we were editing, we we were all in a room together, listening and mm -hmm. and picking. And so it's, you know, it it I don't want to say it. I don't know if it gets any easier necessarily, but at the same time, I was just so pleased with some of the first cuts of the album just because of the way, just because of the sound. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't think it was me. I was like, really? Like this is <laughs> somebody? Like <laughs> sure, this is somebody else? But, um, but one of the things that I great, really appreciate about what uh, what they did for the album, and I'm not trying to, to give away any secrets, but for a long time, I always thought that oh, you know, if I'm going to record a solo classical album, I want to find a nice room that I want to record in and get and capture that sound. And it was Patrick. He said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Let me set up. I'm gonna I'm gonna set up these mics, you know, about four or five different microphones, and we're just we're gonna be in a dry room, and let's do it that way, and in you know just because it's somebody who's always that goes like against all of our training. You're like, no, you have to know how it sounds in the room, what's happening. But I'm so glad that that we did that. So it, yeah, isn't that interesting? Because I yeah. I think back to that 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 the Rostropovich recording of the Bach Shell Suites. He recorded mm -hmm. in some room that was like. Probably actually a great room, but they're like it sounds like there are like rats running around the room, and it's like yeah. you know, it's like you ba you baked this acoustic into your sound, and versus like the highest qual quality yeah. possible mics. It's so interesting. Like my limited experience doing recording, I'm like I'm like again I'm like extremely disappointed in myself, and then I just kind of get used. It's like well that's just what I do. It's like I'm I'm much more used to editing myself on audio or video these days, and I yeah. just sort of know that that's Jason right there. I just sort of I'm, I I know you know that it, like my my. My, my takeaways with everything I just like wow I I tend to be late 
and I tend to like whack everything way too hard. Those are like my two, <laughs> my two like general general takeaways. Like I'm never early. Like even when I like record Good. myself playing with a metro, I'm like, how can I be late? I'm listening, and it's like, and, and yet I'm I'm late with myself, you know. But it, they sound great. It, bo- oh, bo- well, both well, the albums, and yeah. it's really fun to like go and th- I'm thinking like, wow, if you could think of two. I mean, th- I guess maybe you could think of two more different albums, but they're pretty different releases coming out and. and and, and uh, uh, yeah, they, they both sound fantastic. Thank you. And well, that, you know, it's funny you mentioned about self-critique, but when, when confronted with something like this, I try to think of what I would say to my students. And mm-hmm. one thing I always tell them is that you are your own worst critic because you hear yourself play every day. Oh, yeah. But, but I don't hear them. I hear, I hear them play once or twice a week. And, mm-hmm. you know, I hear, I'm like, hey, this progress is here. You don't hear that. And it's the same. And so trying to, I guess that's maybe if we think about it that way, we can be a little bit more forgiving to ourselves and things that we do. So, um, but well, and, and with the difference in them and I'm, and I don't know, and I'm not trying to sound like, and maybe it's, it's a pipe dream or, or something, but I, going back to just thinking about what all the things that the base can do and maybe some people think like, well, I don't know, can I do that? And I just want to kind of think about how we don't have to be mutually exclusive to anything as musicians, you know, especially in the 21st century with the access to technology and recording and listening and transcribing and, and, and everything. And so the my hope is just, I mean, to share just some of, you know, my ideas and, you know, whether it's music I wrote and played or, or just or embracing the tradition of our of our great instrument and but just show people to you it can be done i mean you know if you do the work and follow the process and listen to your teachers obviously and uh, and there's so much that we can do you know and i and i see it as just an opportunity and i'm and, and i mean and maybe i don't know if it's a if it's a pride thing or what but i did want to release both of these albums at the same time and this is not, I, I don't mean to speak negatively of anybody or the system, but I didn't want to be seen as as this type of bass player or that type of bass player. You know what I mean? I mean, sure. like, you, you know, and that's, and and not that that's a bad thing, it, you know, to be, to, but, I, but I wanted to show like, no, this is, I try to do all of this, you know, to the best of my ability. So that's. I mean, that was the goal, anyway, of just showing that, no, we can do all these these different types of things. And it's not, it doesn't mean we have to. When, when I teach, um, I focus on three things when teaching. Um, uh, the first, fundamentals, I mean, it's at the point now we all have to be able to play the instrument really well. And we have so many resources now. I mean, you could you, you could go old school with Samandal, or you could go new school with Raboth, or I try to get my students into the Levinson book. If, yeah, that's yeah, a great eventually. Book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just because it's three octave everything, and you're gonna mm-hmm. <laughs> you're gonna be working, mm-hmm. but it it'll make you better, and you can mm-hmm. and you can play anything anywhere on the instrument, and so um, so fundamentals. Then I try to get them to at least be embrace some type of versatility, so that they can learn a different type of music that they maybe wouldn't have first thought of, and then find what they're passionate about to, to learn. Like, what do you want to learn? Mm-hmm. You know, what do you um, I think about one of my, um, I, I got to give a shout out to one of my students. His name's Raul Reyes. And um, he graduated uh, from UCO in 2017 and then did his master's at North Texas in jazz with Lynn Seaton. But now he's, uh, and so, sorry if I sound like Howard Wallowitz on, uh, on the Big Bang Theory when he always talks about being an astronaut. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, but uh, Raul is, um, he started this fall at the Juilliard School studying with Ben Wolf for his artist diploma. So I'm, I'm immensely proud of him, and it's. I wish I could take all the credit for it, but the reason I, why I bring him up is that he's he's gone more of a jazz and improvisational route with what he's doing. But when he was here, we did that. But he also played a senior recital where he played the the Kusevitsky Concerto. He played the Arpeggion mm-hmm. Sonata. You know, mm-hmm. played some Bach and and because I said no, these this is kind of the expectation of of facility on this instrument now so if you want to go if you want to pursue some of these other jazz things you have to show that you can do this too you know so that's and but he's chosen to kind of go this other route and i think that's and that's exactly what i hope for all my students i hope that they can i mean be the best that that you can be as steve martin says be so good they can't ignore you right (laughs) and 
and then find understand that you can play more than one type of music and then find what, what it is that you want to do maybe for yeah. me it's just i can't decide maybe that's why i <laughs> maybe, no, maybe i it, went down this path but no it's a beautiful yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. thing it's yeah. a beautiful thing um this is super random it says you brought up steve martin have sure. you checked out only murders in the building <laughs> of course okay and I, I bring this up you're on a podcast it's like i like i heard it's like wait a minute steve martin is doing a show about starting a true crime pro- podcast yes, yeah. i am on board and, and and talk about an artist who's super like like somebody mm-hmm. that I've thought about a lot. Like, what mm-hmm. what an interesting path. Somebody who, yeah, talk about doing everything right. For, yeah. Like, like oh, yeah. artist in the truest sense. Like, mm-hmm. he was like OG, probably the biggest stand up comedian in the world, or one of the the couple, and then walked away from it intentionally. And and yeah, okay. So I'm a musician. Well, I, and, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, but you know what? Well, I want to point out a few things. I'm really thankful because my parents had Steve Martin, you know, records. You know, wild. We were wild yeah. and crazy guys. You know, I remember hearing that. Yep. You know, growing up, and uh, and then. But just seeing what he's done with a musical career, and one of the, one of my favorite musical experiences, um, I think it was the Oklahoma premiere of the show Bright Star. Mm. We did it at Lyric Theater, and uh, and but Steve, you know, he wrote that show with Edie Brickell. So I mean, it was, which was awesome. I mean, it was it was so well received. Um, it was a great. We had a great band. Um, we we had to extend the run of the show. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, just because it was selling so well, and. Uh, and it was really, really fantastic. But what was really funny about it, I mean, the music is great, but y- you know, all of the notes in the music, you see little Steve Martinisms where, <laughs> you know, cool. like like it says, like, continue glorious boom chick, you know, because it's a bluegrass <laughs> show, right? And it's like, you know that he put that in there because he's, yeah. he's a funny guy, so. Yeah, that is <laughs> but, so cool. <laughs> Well, it sounds like it's uh, it sounds like you have a really full musical life, teaching life, and it's just, it's really cool. It's fun to we we should have done this a long time ago, but it's it's good. Really, seeing an album is always a good excuse. So, sure. um, hopefully, this will be the first of many. I love having folks back on. Like I was talking about Peter Seymour. It's funny. I was like, did, did I just have Peter on? And then I looked. I was like, oh no, it was <laughs> six hundred episodes ago. It was the last yeah. time I had talk, mm-hmm. talked talked to. Cool. So, um, I'll I'll link up I'll link up to everything uh, in your website and. And uh, anything, anything else you want to get out there for folks? Um, no, no. I'm just, man. I'm just so thankful that you had me on. I mean, oh, wow. I, was, I was surprised. I, was I got like, your oh, email. Wow, okay, great. No, no. I got your email. That's like the perfect. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, we, we let's let's just get on and talk because like I've I've always struggled with like, I mean, the the the. the blog and that sort of thing like figuring out how like I, the, the the longer we've gone the less I've done on the blog and like I did have somebody doing like album reviews and then I would do but it's like it's more fun for me to just get on and talk and talk sure. about it and, and send people that way and and it's yeah it's been it's been a uh, yeah so anyway thank you for being on I guess yeah, no thank no I, and and I appreciate it. and just a shout out to just to all the people I mean to OKC and to UCO and everybody that's here and again to Patrick and Christina for everything everything that they've they've done I'm, I'm super thankful and i appreciate you linking to everything and hopefully we'll hang out again I, yeah I, are you, are you, you know, gonna be a, you know well, are you gonna be at tmea in february I, probably and i'm also i'm i should be at asta as well i don't know okay. if you go to asta in atlanta i well. should be at both so okay. hey we got a couple a couple okay. opportunities okay. coming up here okay, okay. so nice. if i don't see you at one i'll see you at the other well, okay you know, we'll, we'll okay nice yeah let's hang out again that would be that would be great thanks again for chatting michael thank you for watching we've got links to the new albums in michael's website in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.